To Real Democracy Now. I'm Nevek Thompson and Real Democracy Now is a podcast for people who think we can and should improve how democracy works. This podcast looks at democracy from different angles to help you think about how democracy might be improved. Welcome to episode three in season three of Real Democracy Now, a podcast. Season three is about elections, electoral systems, electoral reform and alternatives. In this episode, I'm speaking with... My name is John Gastel. I'm a professor of political communication at the Pennsylvania State University and a senior scholar at the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. Recently, John and Eric Olin Wright, as part of the Real Utopias Project, held a three-day workshop called Legislature by Lot. Thanks to David Schechter, I was able to interview John shortly after this workshop to learn more about what was discussed. A copy of the agenda for the workshop, which includes the list of attendees, is available in the show notes for this episode or on the website www.realdemocracynow.com.au. John described this workshop as a deliberation about deliberation. Thanks so much for taking the time to join me so soon after the workshop. Can you tell me a bit about how the Legislature by Lot workshop came about and what were your aims? The origin of the workshop was an idea from Eric Olin Wright to potentially replace the House of Lords with a legislative chamber chosen by random selection. Sometimes this is just called sortition, selection uh, through a random process. That idea had been kicking around in his head for quite a while after he wrote a short op-ed about it. And then he and I met through his larger Real Utopias project, a project designed to push forward radical ideas that might have real practical establishment in the next 10 to 20 years, things like guaranteed basic income and transformation of uh, gender norms and so on. And this book that we're working on is going to be one of the next books in that series. And the conference and workshop we just held is part of the process of writing that book, where everyone writes short essays, we all come together and critique each other for two and a half days, and then revise all of our contributions to that book. So the actually writing the book and, in a sense, reviewing the chapters through the workshop. It's a little different in that the people participating in the conference won't necessarily be the chapter contributors. So everyone who participates in the workshop has a chance to put forward their ideas. And it wasn't so much that they presented draft chapters, though in some cases that's exactly what they are. It's more that everyone gets to put forward their ideas. Some of those won't become chapters. In a couple of cases, people are going to write a completely different paper for their potential chapter And that's sort of the beauty of it, is you find out what are the strongest arguments from different perspectives. And in some cases, the people putting forward those arguments found their arguments wanting and either won't put a different one forward or will change really what they're going to try arguing in the book itself. It makes for a much stronger book and a much more coherent book because we all have the benefit of having heard from each other. Uh, The only chapter that doesn't change is the opening chapter, the one in which Eric Olin Wright and I put forward a proposal for a legislature by lot. The reason we don't want to change that is everyone is responding to that one long anchor essay. And our response will really come in the conclusion of the book when we take stock of all these different points of view. Mm, That's fascinating. So what were the key arguments in favor of using sortition that were discussed over the weekend? Well, first, a quick note, there are so many different ways of implementing sortition. Our anchor essay proposes that in a bicameral legislature, you devote one chamber to sortition and maintain the other chamber as an elected body with a much improved electoral process. So we put in place some campaign finance reform, uh, different ways of of tabulating uh, votes and apportioning seats and so on. So we get to cheat a little in that we get to put some rules in place that might make the elected legislature more attractive Uh, As one colleague pointed out, it sounds an awful lot like Nordic countries, which is fine if that's what you want to sort of think of. And then the other chamber would be a a fully functioning sortition chamber, fully functioning, meaning it has all kinds of responsibilities uh, akin to a conventional legislature. Uh, The elected body might, for instance, be the one that puts in place a prime minister. Maybe the other body has the first shot at the budget. But in all other respects, the, the sortition chamber could do everything, introduce legislation, it would have to approved legislation and so on. Other proposals out there uh, include the 
a mixed model, which colleagues from Ireland and Belgium talked about, where you actually have a single chamber that includes both elected and randomly selected members together. And then there are those who advocate for what they call full sortition, where you maybe only have one chamber, which is by sortition, and you do away with elections altogether. And the most common proposals we'll get into later really don't create a sortition legislature per se. They create a whole network of randomly selected mini publics, which are empowered to do different functions. And they combine to create the equivalent of a chamber without putting in place a single body that serves has members serving for two years or more. So the arguments in favor of our basic proposal of a bicameral system are pretty straightforward. They're things like a higher quality deliberation will ensue, better legislation will pass, the nature of discourse in the larger public might change as they get a real example of what it looks like to work effectively on legislation. And the hope is that when we say there's really better legislation coming out of it, that you actually get more legislation that's oriented toward the long term. You think about an elected body, no matter how you configure your elections, the parties in, in that body have pressure to produce short-term victories, not necessarily real victories in the sense that they accomplish great things for the long term, but things that work well in the next election. Whereas the sortition body has no re-election imperative, they can really focus on the long term. In fact, one proposal put forward was that the sortition body should have as its primary charge representing future generations, people who can't vote because they, they don't exist on earth yet. And so they would always be looking at legislation for the long term and might, in a practical sense, be requiring accounting and reports that are oriented towards the effects downstream of policies 20, 40 years later. Might create a whole industry for uh, modeling in the social sciences. That's the basic idea. And the basic advantages are really in terms of improving the quality of public discourse, deliberation, and ultimately legislation. Oh, that's interesting. So the, the majority of the workshop was responding to your chapter, which had the bicameral, because one of the things that I've always sort of wondered about, and I'm very supportive of mini publics, but I was very concerned that if you had a, a legislature that was solely selected by sortition, I was just wondering you, whether that would give a lot of power to public servants in terms of agenda setting and advising the parliament. Was that canvassed at all? Absolutely. Uh, if you think of the, it was a two and a half day conference. If you think of it in terms of kind of a, a, a grim post-apocalyptic action movie, uh, onto the screen at the beginning comes our character, the bicameral sortition legislature. And then from off screen comes a shovel that whacks it over the head and it just lies on the ground seemingly dead. That is for, for most of the conference, our proposal was just pounded uh, in that uh, a lot of people really don't think there should be a full-time sortition body even if we have empowered many publics that create all the same uh, outputs, you know, they, they do the same functions. But then, as always happens in these movies, you know, if the villain isn't dead, it's going to come back. And so right, right on the last half day of the conference, in came the true sortitionists who are not only revived our bicameral legislature, but then whacked it over the head again with a shovel saying it didn't go far enough. And then they came in with the arguments for why elections would actually undermine a sortition body. And the only way you'll have really effective uh, democracy is, is through fully empowered sortition. But even they weren't necessarily advocates of a sortition body that remains in place for two years. And often the analogies back to ancient Greece were debating over the, the nuances of how ancient Athens used sortition. But one of the real points of emphasis was it wasn't just about random selection. It was about rapid rotation so that even if you were selected to be government, you were only government for a day or you know, government for a few days or a week or what have you. You weren't government for the next two years. There are exceptions to that. And there were agencies that uh, would have officers chosen by selection who would serve longer. But the point is that there was a real variety of different ideas for sortition. Some of those addressed some problems more effectively than others. Some created their own problems. But that was what was most exciting for me, was that the idea of sortition isn't a singular idea. It's useful to have our anchor essay propose a bicameral model, and then everyone kind of takes that as a point of departure. But really, it was a point of departure. They went all kinds of different places from there. Mm, that, that's <laughs> fascinating. Um, and I'm sure you will have hopefully discussed the thing that I'm going to raise in my next question, which is there's growing interest in sortition, but 
there do remain a number of concerns about how it might work in practice, and you've sort of covered some of them. How did the workshop deal with potential problems people have raised about the use of uh, legislatures selected by sortition? Well, let's start with the original proposal for a bicameral uh, sortition assembly, or for that matter, any full-time sortition assembly. So in, in this scenario, you would select members who would serve for, say, a minimum of two years, perhaps renewable for another two years, and they would be very well paid and taken care of such that you really create a strong incentive for participation. So the point is that you've got people serving with a huge range of functions for a long period of time, right? Two years is a long time for the average citizen. So in that scenario, the biggest concerns were these. The first was, even, even in a you know benign scenario where all these citizens are well-intentioned and and maintain their values and everything, they could just get completely overloaded, completely overwhelmed. The argument here is that in the elected chamber, uh, sure, people get overwhelmed and they they turn to their party for answers. When representatives or members of parliament step forward to vote, they're often just following the signal of a party. In some cases, they don't even have any choice. In the sortition assembly, it's more presumed that everyone thinks independently and tries to arrive at independent judgments. It's not as clear what the role of parties would be because there's no electoral imperative. So the the flood of legislation, not only the laws they have to vote on, but the laws they could be introducing, they could be considering, it's really infinite. And so they'll get overwhelmed. Now, the most benign version of this is, well, they're just overwhelmed and they do the best they can and eh, it might function fine. But more realistically, they'll, they'll turn somewhere for help. And they can turn one of two places, really. They can turn to the parties and just replicate the party structure. And then everyone just votes based on what party they identify with the most and what have you really achieved in that case. Another uh, version of this argument is that they'll become subject to technocratic capture. That is, the bureaucracy of, whether it's Canberra or Washington, D.C. or any capital, that infrastructure of bureaucracy, legislative aides and so on, who will really run the legislature uh, and the citizens will rely on them to such an extent that you'll have unelected technocrats making policy. Some argue that this already exists in some countries and in elected systems, but the point is the sortitionists uh, would be even uh, more vulnerable to that argument. A more sinister version of this argument is that the technocrats are already captured by special interests who have uh, indirectly influenced who's in those positions. So really, the Sartitian Assembly, unbeknownst to it, is serving powerful interests that are manipulating the information they're getting behind the scenes. Now, a more sinister version of this argument says even if the Sartitian Assembly could make uh, you know, smart decisions and so on, it will be directly captured by special interests who have the means to corrupt them. Uh, so here they'll be subjected to bribery, all kinds of indirect benefits even if you put in place strong ethics laws, such as when you leave the assembly, you can't then work for 10 years for anyone who lobbied the legislature. But money always finds a way, is the argument here. And why are these folks not more subject, or why are they more subject to corruption than an elected legislature? Well, we debated that a fair bit. The argument against sortition was that, well, members of parties are insulated by their party from bribery and special interests. The counter argument was, are you kidding? Was, was that supposed to be satirical? And so clearly there was a strong disagreement about that. It's a very hypothetical question since no body like this has ever existed. But those really were the biggest concerns everywhere from just simply being overloaded to being completely captured by special interests and the most powerful, you know, obviously financial interests. And I suppose all the mini publics I've seen in action have facilitators to support them. And I just wonder how this might work in a parliamentary setting and whether if, you, if they did have facilitators, it's giving an unacceptable level of, a, of power and authority to those people. Well, every mini public really does have the same problem on a smaller scale that this assembly would have, which is what is the oversight process that governs not just the use of facilitators, but also the creation of uh, you know, briefing materials, issue framings, and so on. There's a small number of articles and books focusing on this problem with many publics. And it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. The best way of approaching it is uh, transparency and oversight. So first, transparency. So how are the facilitators chosen? How are the briefing materials created and so on? has to be publicly accessible. And most organizations do a pretty good job of this. Some though, some many public organizers are more concerned about carefully crafting things and want more privacy for that. 
that would not work in something like a sortition assembly. You couldn't have that level of control that you do when you're a private organization setting up a mini public. What the sortition assembly would need then is a really strong oversight body. Organizations like New Democracy have boards and so on. Uh, the Citizens Initiative Review in Oregon, which is a process that lets citizens write a, a one-page analysis of referenda and initiatives that show up on the ballot for the whole electorate. That process has a CIR commission that oversees it. And the commission is made up of a few appointees from people in government, but mostly it's made up of uh, former members of citizen initiative review panels chosen by their peers, uh, plus some former uh, facilitators from the process. So that's the basic idea for the Statistician Assembly is you need some body overseeing its whole process to maintain its integrity, which doesn't have at that time the power of decision making within the process. And this actually gets to the larger principle from uh, several participants in the conference, which is as much as possible, you want to divide up the responsibilities of a sortition assembly. So not only do you have an oversight committee that might itself be a sortition body uh, overseeing the whole process, but then you might actually differentiate between a prioritization uh, panel. So you, you create a randomly selected body that simply sets out the broad legislative priorities. Then for each of those, say, six priorities for the coming year, you might have a separate set of six uh, different assemblies that prioritize legislation within that theme. Here are the most important bills and things we want to make sure get introduced and so on. Some of those, by the way, might be bills that were written in the elected chamber, but that leadership in that chamber doesn't want to bring to the floor. So the legislation might even be pre-baked. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But then you'd have whole different bodies that are actually reviewing prospective individual pieces of legislation and making recommendations or actually, in, in some scenarios, uh, being empowered to cast votes up or down. The reason I, I'm bringing that up again is our idea of a bicameral uh, system really does have a single sortition assembly managing all that. It could actually be farming out those responsibilities to empowered many publics that are connected to it. More on that later. But again, the, the most common vision of this was a whole mix of bodies. And you can see what they're trying to do with, with that approach is they're trying to get rid of the overload problem, right? So that if you're asked to serve as a citizen, it might be for two or three weeks and then you're done. Uh, it also uh, potentially addresses the corruption problem by differentiating the responsibilities among the various bodies. So you can't have any clean path of control, but also it just creates too many citizens for any uh, special interest or moneyed interest to try to manage, as opposed to a single body that you know is going to be there for a few years, that might be worth your investment to try to corrupt key members of that body. Mm. The American Congress and, and so on seems to be huge and powerful interests seem to be able to manage them very well. Although, as you say, they a lot of them stay there for a long time, I guess. So that makes it easier. Electoral change and institutional change generally are considered very difficult to achieve. I've been interviewing people for season three about electoral systems and there doesn't seem to be much change around the world in, in those. It just seems to be a difficult thing to achieve um, and very slow moving. So did the workshop talk about the how of implementing legislature by lot? Absolutely. And what Eric Olin Wright calls these in terms of the larger Real Utopias project is transition strategies. And a point he emphasizes is that as pragmatic as you want to be, you need to be careful uh, that the transition strategy itself is consistent with the end state you're looking for. Now, he de-emphasizes truly utopian end states. He wants you to think about things that achieve much of the value you're trying to achieve. And so in this case, you know, the value is obviously direct citizen engagement in self-government uh, through a structured process that encourages deliberation. So don't, don't strive for perfection there, but do get far enough down the road with your idea that when you think about these transition strategies, you really are moving toward that. So let me ex explain that in terms of some, some specific strategies. One approach is to simply increase institutionalized consultation uh, using many publics. So the idea there is you actually don't want to initially empower these bodies. You want to regularize them. Uh, improve the kind of infrastructure for setting up many publics very much in, in partnership with government. So it would be part of the regular functioning of a, a parliament or a, a legislature or what have you 
to convene these bodies and be advised by them. And a concrete example of this actually is in Mongolia, uh, where Jim Fishkin, uh, who uh, created the deliberative poll, uh, helped that country establish a process that is consulted on constitutional amendments. And they don't have any authority, but all they are able to do is to review prospective amendments after a period of deliberation and you know, say what they think of them after deliberating and then compare that with their initial attitude so that the legislature gets an idea of what citizens might think of these ideas if they really had the chance to sit down and deliberate. Now, critics of that approach say, well, actually, that could, that could perversely undermine sortition because what that does is it creates in the public's mind this idea that, well, random selection and, and these citizen bodies are only appropriate for consultation, apparently. And if they don't seem to have much impact, well, then the whole idea is delegitimized. Well, why would you do this? This is a waste of everyone's time. It's worse than doing nothing, right? That's, that's the criticism there. But those who advocate it say, no, that's a first step. And then once people develop some trust that these consultative bodies are making good judgments, both in government, they develop trust and in the wider public, well, then you can start empowering them. Well, people, some people disagree about that. Some would like to take a mixed approach. And one of the most innovative ideas here, I think this was coming from our colleagues in Belgium, is that uh, when you hold an election, you could potentially give voters the option of not just choosing the parties, but also choosing instead to have seats chosen by law. So if you do have a large body like the U.S. Congress with over 400 seats, that might mean that if you know 10% of the public says, I don't trust any of these parties, I I'd rather just have random citizens in there. Well, now you've suddenly got you know, 40, 45 members of Congress chosen by law. Now, obviously, there's much debate about what would happen to those people in an elected chamber. Would they be overwhelmed by their elected peers? Well, th there was some pretty lively debate about that. But again, it's a different strategy. And if the sortition... Uh, legislators perform well, it might augur for giving them their own body, especially if they outperform the elected members in, in so many ways uh, in the public's estimation. But then others, and here I would put the Sortition Foundation, which for those interested in learning more about this, is a great resource in terms of what's going on on the ground. Eric and I are uh, advocates for the idea in a formal sense. We're, we're both university professors trying to advance really the theoretical and, and empirical understanding of these bodies. But the Sortition Foundation is absolutely all in uh, for advocating the idea, and they, they keep track of these things. One of their uh, most exciting sort of points of interest is uh, Scotland. And the argument there is that there are folks in Scotland who are very interested in this idea, and that if Brexit were to go south and uh, Scotland broke away, uh, they might very well create an, an assembly um, that has a Sortition Chamber within it. So they, they're looking for more a clean break strategy. They want to take a body, put it in place, fully functioning, and see what happens. But again, you can see those range. And then, of course, there's the other uh, in between, which is where people want to have institutionalized mini publics that are empowered. Whether or not that transitions to a full sortition legislature is a, a point of disagreement. But all of those are plausible scenarios. And I, I would say to those who are discouraged by the pace of institutional change, step back a little, look at the longer arc of history, and you'll see pretty dramatic institutional change in all kinds of categories, from social issues to economic issues and so on. Sure, you know nobody's getting their dreams realized in terms of a, a full slate of institutional changes, but I, I would beg to differ with those who say that institutional change isn't happening or is happening at a very slow pace. I would argue that it's actually accelerating. And we can look at various uh, issues where you know, within 10 years, all of a sudden, there's a big change that, that really nobody saw coming. And the fact that we don't see it coming and the fact that we keep missing these things in the past should be a sign that we really have trouble forecasting the rate of change in these kinds of things. Certainly, that's uh, something that I've noticed is that when you say that you don't see it, then suddenly it's there. I mean, there's a lot of that in uh, attitudinal change. You know, got a um, same-sex marriage postal survey happening here at the moment, and it's it's not that long ago that that would have been ridiculous to think that the majority of people might support same-sex marriage, but now it's very much considered just mainstream. So, yes, it, things certainly do change. You've mentioned the book that's going to be produced from the workshop and people are going to write papers for that and so on. Were there other actions discussed to move this agenda forward? There was discussion of a few different strategies in the near term for moving the idea forward. I would say that that's really not the focus for Eric and I. Uh, 
we're a little overwhelmed by the, the managing just the book project itself. Uh, and the way the book fits into all this is quite straightforward. It's that there really hasn't been a systematic discussion of this idea from a variety of perspectives, bringing to bear all the knowledge we have about many publics and such, or for that matter, even ancient Athens. So pulling that all into one place where someone interested in this idea can really think through the different arguments is is our objective. And and ideas matter, right? Ideas really contribute to uh, the development of new institutions and policies. Again, with the example of universal basic income, it was exactly that. A lot of careful thought went into that, which ultimately is now yielding some experiments of varying quality around the world. So aside from the book, uh, there are other folks, again, I mentioned the Sartitian Foundation, who are looking for specific points of entry with this idea, whether it's replacing uh, an unelected chamber in Canada or the UK or, or lots of points of departure in the Commonwealth. Uh, one discussion was, uh, is it not the case that in Queensland, uh, the uh, second chamber was removed, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, well, the idea was, well, maybe there would be popular support for reintroducing it, but as a sortition body. And then in Belgium, actually in Belgium, Iceland, a couple other countries, uh, France, lots of folks seeking elective office, not just in minor parties, are talking about this idea. That seems to be a real point of entry is, you know, pick a country that uh, has the idea already in the political discourse. People are getting excited about it and go there. One thing that I certainly didn't know before the conference, but someone had done his uh, doctoral work on this, is sortition is actually used uh, within the French army. That, of course, being France, uh, it's essentially uh, unionized. And so you represent your portion of the military, uh, you're, you're part of that branch of the military through a random selection process. And there's a, a somewhat formalized process for you meeting with your constituents before you represent their views. So as much as some countries like the United States and, and across the Commonwealth, but also in Argentina, South Korea, and so on, you have juries or juries being introduced that are familiarizing people with the idea of random selection and deliberation. In other countries, you have sortition that is empowered on, on policy questions already. Uh, so those seem to be obvious places the Iceland example also illustrates that sometimes you have crises. And in that case, Iceland's government keeps churning over. And it's in a situation of crisis or anticipated crisis that you might get a break. So, for instance, why was the British Columbia Citizens Assembly the first of its kind in the world? Well, British Columbia had this problem with its electoral system, creating these radical changes in the composition of its uh, parliament in that province because it was easy for a, a party winning a plurality of votes to wind up with almost every seat because of how the districts were shaped. So in that case, you actually had a, a lot of people across political parties thinking something has to change, and you hand it to the citizens, and this is what they come up with. So that was sort of a crisis, uh, but kind of the anticipation that we keep having uh, such rapid change in government that we can't do anything coherent. So you look for opportunities, points of entry, and then you can disagree about how far you go when you get an opening. But that's the basic strategy that folks like the Sortition Foundation are looking for is where is this idea getting talked about? And that's where we'll put all our energy. Looking back over the um, long weekend of the workshop, what surprised you most about the discussions and so on? I think what surprised me most was realizing how many people are talking about this idea out there in the world and how many examples there are of it. I happened to know about a, a couple folks who had implemented sortition in a couple South American high schools. That project isn't being sustained over time, but it was an experiment. Well, it turns out that in Europe, there have actually been some, uh, I think it was university level student organizations that are using sortition. And it's being used within some political parties, again, particularly in Europe. But the idea that sortition is already a viable means of selection for representation in different parts of society. I didn't realize how far along that was. It's very encouraging. It is. It's funny when you think about different democratic methods of decision making, like consensus, majority rule and so on. I had written that, you know, random selection is one of them. It's, it's radically egalitarian. Uh, and if you're in a small group that is hung up on what you consider a minor issue, it's not a bad way of just resolving the issue. You know, which movie do we rent tonight? You don't want to have a round and round of votes requiring a two thirds supermajority. You just want to watch a movie. So at some point, just roll the dice. And rolling the dice has a, a funny role in history. It actually 
goes back quite a ways that it, at some point this was even thought to be a divine process where rolling the dice or throwing the bones or whatever was the intervention of, of divine spirits. But in the modern world, uh, again, this rationalized version of random selection actually is more ubiquitous than I thought. That was that was both encouraging and a little bit surprising to me and will be reflected in the chapters of the book so that people get a sense for just how much far farther down the road we might be than you'd think. And was there a discussion at the workshop about sort of some of those concepts that we consider often are basic to democracy around representation and what that means? Absolutely. And we talked about different theories of re representation and different theories of accountability. And I just drop in a, a couple thoughts here. One is the ascendance of the idea of descriptive representation. What that means is that more than ever, people expect their representatives to be like them. Not, not that they like them, uh, but that they resemble them. And you can see the rise of identity politics being a, a parallel to this. You know, in some parts of the world, as you know, uh, even gender quotas have been established for uh, legislative bodies. Argentina is developing its jury system right now. And in some parts of the country, they're requiring six men and six women on every jury. That's descriptive representation, where you want to make sure that the bodies that represent us are descriptive of the population. Well, random selection, stratified random selection embodies that principle. So when many publics are created, especially smaller things like citizens' juries, they're very careful to stratify the random selection so that it is descriptively representative. Right out of the box, that's a real advantage to sortition in terms of representation. Now, on accountability, there are different conceptions of accountability, too. Well, electoral accountability is the one we're most familiar with, and sortition simply does not have it. If you try to implement something like a recall process, so someone randomly selected is somebody people don't like, that sort of undermines sortition. I mean, the whole point was to randomly select people and let them serve, not to then impose an electoral accountability mechanism on them. But there are different kinds of accountability. If you look back to what accountability uh, means, one of its meaning is to give an account, right? Are you accountable? So you make a judgment, okay, now I'm going to hold you accountable, meaning you must give me an account. And obviously, you will be judged by the quality of that account. Now, interestingly, on the most common sortition body in the world, the jury system, it's often explicitly the case that juries are not to give accounts. They are to render a verdict and go home. In some cases, the, in Argentina, they're, they're debating this very idea. The press aren't supposed to talk to them. In the U.S., they didn't used to so much, and now they get, the press is getting more excited about interviewing jurors. But there's a whole theory behind why they shouldn't give accounts, right? They're supposed to render a verdict and be done with it. And that resolves the case. No further discussion. But a legislative body passing laws and so on would have to give accounts. And we might think very carefully about the kinds of mechanisms they would have in place for that. So there is an accountability in the sense that if you serve in this body, you know you're going to have to justify and explain what you did. Now, we emphasize, Eric Olin Wright and I emphasize in our proposal that they would actually all vote by secret ballot. It is one of the most straightforward protections against corruption that could be done. But nonetheless, even if your vote is secret, you still might be called on to give an account. And you might volunteer how you voted, obviously. So that's, I think, an important concept that we don't talk about enough with accountability, even in electoral systems. It shouldn't just be about re-election and so on. It should also be about giving persuasive reasons for your actions. And in that sense, the Sortition Assembly might perform quite well uh, in terms of accountability. And that's an interesting point because most of the deliberative mini-publics at sort of topic-by-topic -topic level, certainly here in Australia, there's a lot of support and a lot of pressure for their decision making to be by consensus whilst there's there's an acceptance that there may not be consensus and therefore there can be minority reports if you like and so on generally speaking i'd say th there's a an argument around whether or not you actually have voting at all there'll often be what you might call a straw poll or they might use dot democracy during the process, but the aim as they come to make their final recommendations is to not have it a vote. And if it does come to a vote, that it's a, a super majority type of situation rather than a 50 plus one. Was that covered as well? Yes, indeed. And this is a very important issue. I can't stress enough that the idea of deliberation needs to be decoupled from the notion of consensus for a couple reasons. One is, first, we need to get clear about what consensus is versus unanimity. 
So bodies that function by consensus generally don't require unanimity. Uh, take the Quaker meeting as one of the sort of ancient examples of this that still exists today. Uh, the clerk reads the sense of the meeting and says to the gathered members, I sense that the meeting has arrived at this. What the clerk is essentially saying is, look, <laughs> it's time to shut up unless you absolutely oppose this idea. In fact, some Quakers will, will say that I stand aside, meaning I don't support this decision, but I'm not going to block it. And that's a super important distinction, right? That group does not have unanimity, but the the sense of the meeting is correct and the meeting is able to move forward with whatever decision it is, such as in the case of many meetings over the last few decades, they may have arrived at the decision that they're now happy to marry same-sex couples. Um, and you can imagine how strident some older members might be in opposition to that since it is a Christian group and there's a lot of ideas about that in sort of the dogma around Christianity, even in Quakerism. Uh, the point is that, again, consensus is not unanimity. Now, when you get to a mini public that has no theological basis for its decision making, the idea of consensus creeps back in. And but it takes a somewhat sinister form if you're not careful in that it starts to sound like we need to leave this room all in agreement. And we need to, in particular, not have people standing aside or producing minority reports. We need to have one voice. That is, in my in my view, a perversion of the spirit of deliberation. The spirit of deliberation includes both encouragement of persuasion toward finding common ground and potentially uh, building a large majority for something, uh, and openness to different points of view and, and real active debate. So it's, it's like, you know, when a jury has to reach a unanimous verdict, there's a, a famous instruction that judges will give when the jury seems to be hung. The judge will say two things. One, go back in there and keep your mind open, be open to persuasion, whether you're in the majority or the minority right now, really listen to the other side. But do not conform to the other side for the sake of reaching a unanimous verdict. You must be persuaded uh, one way or the other. And, you know, that's not that's not really a paradox. Those are just two complementary virtues. So as much as we do need to talk about the importance of finding common ground and, and the spirit of consensus, we also need to keep that adversarial element in deliberation, continue to keep the arguments going forward forcefully. Now, in practical terms, I think that means you actually do want to encourage there being a coherent minority report. So you tell people at the outset, we hope we can find a broad agreement on a way forward. The, the stronger our majority, the clearer the signal will give, and we won't all agree. Let's just understand that from the beginning. I mean, if we do happen to all agree, fantastic. But that agreement will be more meaningful if we really stress that there will always be an outlet for other voices. In fact, there may even be a document for a concurring opinion, as happens with, say, the U.S. Supreme Court, where there's a majority, but there might be an opinion in concurrence saying, yeah, I agree with the majority, but my reasoning is slightly different. You want to record that. So again, I, I encourage thinking about deliberation in a way that has both this unitary impulse and the adversarial impulse. For those interested in that idea more theoretically, I take you all the way back to a wonderful book by uh, Jane Mansbridge called Beyond Adversary Democracy that lays out these unitary and adversarial impulses in democracy. And John, that makes me realise that I, I've taken for granted the whole concept that a legislature selected by lot, by sortition, would in fact be a house of deliberation. That isn't something that necessarily I should be taking for granted, is it? I mean, it could operate in a different way, but I'm assuming that the the discussions do put legislature by lot together with deliberation. Like that's you are sort of thinking of it as a deliberative mini public, even though it's it's not very mini. Absolutely. I and this gets back to your point about what is the role of voting in a mini public or in a sortition assembly and so on. I think voting is essential. And I think when no vote takes place, a hidden vote took place. And transparency is so important in these bodies partly because there isn't an electoral mechanism for accountability that voting has to take place. I actually like the secret ballot concept that your vote shouldn't have to be recorded publicly. You didn't volunteer to stand for office for so many years and put your you know, vote uh, down uh, to represent the same things you said in your campaign platform. You were randomly selected. You don't need that level of personal focus on how you happened to have voted. You should have the, the privacy that a juror has, really, to not have to do that. But whether it's an assembly or, or a, a mini public, um, it is important that we do think about that vote and that decision point where you, you had a very structured deliberation and you're absolutely right. There's no point in creating a sortition assembly or any body like this 
if it doesn't have a good deliberative process. Fortunately, that we know a lot about. We know how to structure discussion for deliberation. And these mini publics, almost without exception, perform quite well at deliberating. It's almost comic how bad our elected legislatures are compared to these uh, mini publics, which are easily arranged. I'd say it's all, I say it's almost comic because it's actually tragic uh, how poorly they perform by deliberative criteria. But again, deliberating and voting are not antithetical. I would argue that they're necessary partners, that you don't want to foreground the vote, just as actually on a jury, it's a really bad idea to do a straw poll right at the beginning because it tends to get the jury too focused on the verdict and not enough on the evidence that should lead to the verdict. So it's the same thing in a mini public or in a sortition assembly. You want to foreground the deliberative process, the careful weighing of perspectives, experiences, and evidence, uh, and then that leads ultimately to a decision. But there does need to be a key voting step along the way. Are there other things that you think uh, were interesting or unexpected or challenging that came out of the, the discussions? Not exactly. I had a somewhat different vantage point than most of the participants in the workshop, even a slightly different vantage point than Eric Holman Wright. So Eric has been part of this Real Utopias project for, for so long. He's actually studied utopias for a very long time. And so he came into it with this larger perspective of here is one of the next real potential institutional transformations of society. And he's excited to be a part of it and was very actively critiquing the proposal. Everybody else there was really putting forward ideas, listening and thinking. The thing that surprised me a little bit, and I should have seen this coming, was I knew either, well, I knew most of the people in the room, and some of them I've known quite a long time, uh, people like Jane Mansbridge or Jim Fishkin or Ned Crosby, who were all sort of famous in the field of deliberative democracy. Um, but I also knew or expect to have long-term connections with everybody else in the room, because this really is the focus of what I do. I mean, I study deliberation in all these different forms. I actually found it a little bit stressful. Everyone behaved really well, but there are some strong differences of opinion. In some cases, people have invested decades of their life into these different approaches and philosophies. And I found myself trying to carefully facilitate, right? These strongly held, you know, life commitment disagreements. And maybe I did a good job or maybe everyone self-facilitated really well. But at the end of two and a half days, I sort of breathed a sigh of relief. Hey, we made it. You know, we got through this process, not just tolerating each other, but really respecting each other. And I, I think actually some, some connections improved where people might have been, you know, at odds with each other historically. Um, they might now understand each other better. And so it's kind of sweet in a way that here we had a deliberation about deliberation and we deliberated pretty well. But I only realized in retrospect that I had unconsciously volunteered to be what we sometimes call the social facilitator, as well as the you know, note taker of every last fine point. I was surprised that that was happening. But in retrospect, I, why was I surprised? Of course, that had to happen because we made a point of bringing together people who have very different experiences and perspectives. So it was challenging, but fortunately, it was quite successful. After the three days of deliberation, on deliberation, was there a consensus in the group? I don't think there was a full consensus. I think of all the people who participated in the conference, the one who actually participated by Skype, Lynn Carson uh, from Australia, she came in by Skype at the end of one of the days and talked about deliberation and many publics. And it's interesting. I, she, you know, she regretted that she wasn't able to be there in person with us, but had read the papers and thought about them quite a bit. The reason I say I, I think she might have represented the consensus position is her real focus was, how do you ensure quality deliberation in these bodies? A question you were raising a, a few minutes ago. And she articulated uh, some key points that she's learned over the course of her career in, in all this. And she's actually dealt with all these different deliberative processes. She's very eclectic about the different principles she brings to bear on a given process. And I think everyone could kind of look at her and her point of view and say, I want that and I want this or I want this other thing. And so, so in some ways, Carson staked out the common ground. It was good for us because I think people do get a little caught up in uh, the, the finer points of how they would do different variations on sortition and forget that there is actually a pretty broad consensus among folks who, who study many publics that, yeah, you know, these things really can work and citizens can provide really good insight. And there are ways of making many publics more participatory and so on uh, that involve the, the larger public. And Carson's been there for all of that. And so I think it was great to have her have her bring that perspective. 
I think had she been there in person, she would have achieved the same thing. But the fact that she sort of dropped out of the sky, and she actually knew lots of people in the room, I think maybe more people than I did, gave her maybe a little bit of a, an authority in a way. But then she, you know, came right back out, left Skype. And so it was able to stand as a an articulated point of view that we could all kind of get behind. So maybe for future conferences, I recommend you have some you know, senior practitioner scholar kind of come in from Skype, remind everyone what we all have in common, and then get the heck out before the, you know, the, the arguing and, and so on resumes. <laughs> that sounds great. I suppose my final question about the uh, the workshop is, as well as the book, what is the next steps? Did people agree to meet again? Did they, are they going to continue staying in contact? Did it generate any next steps other than the book? Well, it did introduce in person some folks who had been kind of collaborating electronically, and it was nice to form those relationships. It also pointed out to some scholars that they're actually part of a larger body that includes both scholars and practitioners. And for those who have worked in deliberative democracy for a long time, we're familiar with this, that there really are people out there in the field making things and people back in the universities studying things. And when those two meet, the best things happen. That is, the researchers are, are investigating theoretical questions that have practical aspects to them. The results of those investigations, if they're done well, uh, are very informative to the practitioners. So the practice is improving while the research and theory is improving. And there can be a, tre a tremendous synergy between those if the practitioners are open to the researchers and kind of let them in. And if the researchers are open enough to the practitioners that they can articulate their theoretical question in ways that have direct bearing on practice. I think. There was a, a realization for some people in this group for the first time that that really needs to happen. Others, I, like I said, were very familiar with it. The other thing I would I would say is this may sound too abstract, but it, it reinforced something I've come to believe, which is that you actually do want some separation between the practitioners and the researchers in this regard. So Eric and I have a comparative advantage role specialization that we are best placed to uh, bring together. Uh, theory and research uh, and create uh, strong documents that are useful to, to people in the field and in the academy that advance the idea and, and help set the research agenda for the future. And that we need to kind of stay focused on those sorts of roles. To the extent that he and I get too far into the weeds in practice, we both lose some of the edge to our, our, our academic orientation, but we also potentially lose some credibility. We become apologists for the idea rather than rigorous uh, investigators. And on the other hand, if the practitioners get too far into the research world and focus too much on academic publishing, it may take time away from where their comparative advantage is, which they actually know what's going on in Iceland or Scotland and so on. And so it's not that we operate in to the exclusion of each other. It's that we operate in partnership. Now, I put myself just at the edge of a category, a colleague of mine, uh, I think it was Martin Carcassonne at Colorado State University came up with pracademic, these academics that keep doing practice and being engaged in practice. I'm a little more removed from that in that there's right now in my career, there's such a demand for me to do research that there isn't such a demand for me to actually organize and run a process like I, I did earlier in my career. So I think it brought us together, but it brought us together in the symbiosis as opposed to Eric and I now know what the practical agenda is going forward. We know where the next, you know, real organized campaign should be. We don't. We're interested in that, but we're going to still be able to remove from that. And, and again, I, I actually think that's not only fine, it's appropriate. So I can't answer it to the same degree that, say, the Sartitian Foundation can in terms of or new democracy as to where to where to go next. Uh, but I can say that we will be ready to be there as a research partner, as I've been for the Citizens Initiative Review, uh, say, in Oregon, where I don't get into the practical details of organizing it. But I do evaluate it in such a way that I actually get very concrete feedback on how I think it needs to be revised and improved for the future. One thing I should have asked you earlier, and I just wondered, in uh, season one of the podcast, which was about deliberative mini publics, I interviewed Christina Lafont, and she's quite critical of empowered mini publics, I guess, because she feels that, well, she has a number of reasons, but one of them is that unlike your comment that stratified random sampling gives you a dis descriptive representation, her argument is that once you have these people informed and making decisions that way, they're no longer descriptively representative of the public because they're quite different. Was that something that came up in the weekend at all? Yes. And in a way, you see it in the debate between 
those of us who believe in having a long-term sortition body and those who only believe in a short-term one. There is, by the way, kind of a middle ground. Uh, David Owen and Graham Smith argue for selecting about 6,000 people who are then used in specific ways at different times. The point being that they do develop a little bit of expertise, but they keep coming and going to such an extent that you don't have one body becoming sort of calcified. Uh, there are others who say, no, every random selection should be short term and then boom, you're released. But as I understand this argument, and uh, Christina LaFont isn't the only one making this argument, even say participating in a deliberative poll, which is in a way a thin kind of deliberation. You're there for two and a half days, you're discussing broad issues and so on, um, and mostly formulating questions that you would put to experts, as opposed to being on a small body that's supposed to create some kind of a report or something. Even in those settings, that, that would probably be too much uh, for her and, and other critics. And cr some critics of the deliberate poll have said exactly that. It's no longer a poll. It's some weird thing where you're influenced by whoever happened to be there and so on. You know, if, if that's your point of view, then you simply can't accept these bodies. That, that's right. That deliberation changes people and we don't want people who are changed. But you have to make a principled defense of an uninformed and to a good degree manipulated public. That is, the preferences we express in a public opinion poll are not often reflective preferences, and they're not often well-informed preferences. So, for example, when we run uh, survey experiments with the Citizens Initiative Review in Oregon and other states where it's been tried, one thing we do is we, we have one uh, group that simply expresses its points of view and, and its understanding of the facts without having read the CIR statement. And then another group that read that statement and then uh, various variations that have read, say, official documents and so on. The group that saw the CIR statement actually has uh, a better connection between the facts uh, and how they're voting, between their values uh, and how they think about these things. In other words, they become more reflective and more informed. It, it's very easy to measure and it's consistent effect across. There have been 12 iterations of this now, including the various pilots. Well, if you, do, if you believe that deliberation is, is distorting people, well, is reading the CIR statement itself an example of this kind of distortion? Uh, where do you draw the line? And if it is a distortion, how do you consider it a distortion? These folks now actually better understand the issue. They better understand the relevant facts. Uh, they put in a situation where they're thinking more about their values in relation to the proposal. I think it's hard to defend a less informed, less reflective public. I suppose you ultimately... I uh, have to just say that, that that it's free of manipulation that these deliberative processes have. And for that reason, I prefer it. But the fact is, it's not free of manipulation. It's, it's just subject to a more diffuse manipulation uh, through, again, the concentration of interests that have the money to effectively mount campaigns, influence the media or control the media in some cases and so on. So I, I think it would be a, an interesting debate, uh, but I have much confidence in the side that says that these deliberative mini publics render meaningful judgments that aren't a distortion of the public's values, but are rather a more informed and reflective version of the public's policy judgments, as opposed to the more superficial uh, policy preferences that we pull out of something like an opinion poll. The very final question is, when can we expect to see the book? Probably uh, fall of 2018. I know that sounds like a million years away. Uh, it's you know roughly a year away. Uh, but we actually haven't received the chapters yet. All we had was papers for a conference. People are revising those. We'll see those in December uh, and then January. We'll be revising those and then getting everything back to the publisher in the spring. And it just takes a while to publish a book. So there is a schedule. Verso, V-E-R-S-O, is the publisher that does the Real Utopia series, and they'll do this book. So it's nice this far in advance to know who your publisher, have a plan for it, and they know how to market it. Um, and I should say, Verso is a, is a press that is very interested in academic audiences, you know, graduate students and professors and so on, but has a real primary emphasis on people out in the field, uh, people who are, you know, citizen activists, uh, progressive, you know, democracy reformers and so on. That's the audience they reach effectively. And we think that that audience is ready to engage with this idea. Thank you for joining me today. In the next episode, I will be speaking to Dr. Alan Renwick about electoral reform around the world. So the thing that traditionally has been talked about in the literature on electoral reform is the interests of the people in power. And that is important. So if the people in power see that a different system would serve their interests better, then they're more likely to change the system. That's what happened in France in the mid-1980s. But it seems to me that actually more important in explaining change is the state of public opinion. 
And if public opinion is dissatisfied with the way democracy is working, then politicians will often try to find some kind of way to respond to that. And then whether they decide to respond by proposing electoral reform is going to depend, or or rather on some other reform, is going to depend on the exact details of the system. So if you have a proportional system already, it's fairly easy to kind of tinker with the system in ways that maybe won't be too costly for the politicians, but will at least create the appearance of responsiveness to public concerns about how the system is working. I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for listening to Real Democracy Now! You can find more about today's topic in the show notes at www.realdemocracynow.com.au. If you enjoyed this program, please subscribe to this podcast, write a review, share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation on the webpage or on Facebook or Twitter. I'd love to know what you think is the essence of a real democracy.